so tonight's speaker is uh, Max Frank, principal of the Max Frank Architecture of Miami and uh, also Tokyo. Uh, uh, this is appropriate pairing um, as our previous uh, uh, speaker, uh, Jason Jensen. Um, this last spring, the two were both were together uh, in Mount Vernon, as supported by the, uh, by the School of Architecture. Uh, Max graduated from Cum Laude uh, with a bachelor's degree in architecture from, from uh, this institution. Uh, <laughs> um, and he went on to receive his uh, master's degree at Columbia University, um, along with an honor of award for design excellence. Uh, prior to launching his own firm, uh, he worked for the Office of Modern Architects in London, uh, and thereafter worked for New York based shop architects uh, on several of the projects. Um, of greatest influence, however, uh, from my understanding, uh, it was Max's association with the Florida architect Gene Lee, uh, an important member of the Saratoga, uh, Sarasota uh, School of Architecture. Um, he was raised in the Lee House, and uh, later became his career at Gene's Winter Haven office. Uh, in 1989, um, since opening his own firm, uh, Max has received numerous honors, including six AIA Miami Merit Awards and three AI and Florida Architecture Awards of Excellence. In 2010, he was awarded uh, AI in Miami the first of the year, uh, following previous AI awards for Young Architect of the Year in 2003 and 2007. Um, in, in addition to being recognized for the design work, uh, Max has been active in the planning and advisory circle in Florida. Um, he served as the City of Miami's Planning Advisory Board and Urban Environment League uh, Board of Directors. He has led the Miami Fellows Initiative uh, and continues to serve the Board of Advisors for the Florida International University. Um, with that, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Max Frank. Close family friend 
And uh, actually, I was at Vicenza, I guess it was at Design 7, and I called Jim Weedy from, from Italy and asked him if I could go intern with him. And he's like, gotta call me back in the bathtub right now. So um, I did. He worked for me for a year, but um, he's like, you don't have to come in to work till 11 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I said, sign me up. <laughs> this is one of Gene Lee's homes. After his smaller wooden homes, he started building the East West Concrete, and that became his material of choice. This is a dormant residence built in 65, I believe. Um, and the scale of this is very daunting. You can see the, uh, the cardboard there. And uh, the scary thing is too, that all these pieces would come on a truck and would be set up in one day. And uh, he really was nervous that he overdid this one, but his client seemed to like it, so they proceeded. But Gene had a way of you know, warming up these materials that at the time it was used for bridge spans and very industrial types of projects. But uh, you know, he, he made them look, and he was in the of Lozier trial for the Free Stress Concrete Institute for years and years and years. Um, so for, for decades, he continued to use this Free Stress Concrete. Uh, this was a beach house on, on Anna Maria Island that I, I worked on with him. Uh, I think it's now been converted into a Mediterranean house, but uh, it's a challenging conversion. So this was the house that I grew up in, in Winter Haven. Um, three stress, concrete beams, uh, exposed block walls, walls of glass. So from a very early age, I was um, exposed to you know, a, a different kind of house, a different kind of art. And this was uh, Gene's office that, that I worked in for a while. So after that, internship with Gene, I was at Columbia University. Gene tried to talk me out of again and again and again. He said, you're going to work your mind and all this crazy stuff. They use computers up there. Um, so, anyhow, I jumped readily into the, to the computers. And this is stuff from 15, 16, 17 years ago. But, you know, um, it became a lot different. My first project I worked on was a museum of sex. And after I graduated, it was a shop architects. And, uh, um, I thought I was big stuff working on the Museum of Sex in, in New York. Um, it was this one at the PA Award at the time. And, uh, you know, it was uh, quite a stretch from the concrete double T's past. Uh, there was a model they made. This was a stereolithography model that's in the Museum of Modern Art now. Um, and so it was a year that I was working uh, in New York before I moved to Florida. And uh, uh, for some reason, I decided I, was, I had my time in the city, but I wanted to go off on my own. So I did a stretch from the Museum of Sex to my first house that I designed, which uh, I actually didn't even design it. This was uh, a developer in Miami section of Coconut Grove. He said he needed somebody to basically um, stamp this, this house. And I had just, just recently got my architectural license, so let me learn how things are done, so I did. Uh, this was actually a drug house that got converted into a uh, first time uh, home house, but I had really nothing to do except for looking over the drawings and uh, putting my stamp on it, which is not, just kind of frowned upon, but you got to start somewhere. Uh, somebody else noticed that, and I did some other small homes on the street. I started off my own without any clients, any, just anything. I was actually uh, working on the side for Architect Monica, doing some computer animations and renderings. Um, but my day job was really trying to figure out how, how buildings got uh, designed and permitted um, in the city of Miami, which is uh, a daunting place to get to permitted. So I was not from Miami originally. I was from Central Florida and Gainesville and New York. And I, I chose Miami for its, um, the fact that it was Florida, which I was 
familiar with and was also a big city. Uh, you know, I think the rest of Florida looks at Miami the same way that New York upstate residents look at New York City. It's just that weird thing down there at the bottom. Um, but you know, zooming in, you know, talk a little bit about Miami. You can see the stretch of development here. And that's pretty much all the land that's available. You got Marsh, you got Bay. Um, so just downtown Miami right here. There's nowhere else left to go really. Okay. So my practice in Miami is in Coconut Grove. And even with all this development in Miami, you can see Coconut Grove. It's kind of this green, green belt right here. Uh, it's nestled between downtown and Pearl Gables and the Bay. Zooming in more. Again, you have downtown, Coconut Grove, and most all the projects I'm going to show you tonight are, are from Coconut Grove. Um, it's not a big area, but it's got a pretty uh, um, extensive architectural history. Our office is right here. Um, the big new been used to hit Open Road now is they got uh, sharp angles to do two two kind of towers right here. So I'm going to watch this go up, which I'm excited about. Uh, so Coconut Road is more of this green pocket in Miami. And it actually predates the city of Miami. It was annexed into the city uh, 1850 something. But there's all of these great rock walls and banyan trees and in this picture, it's hard to tell sometimes what came first, the, the wall or the, or the tree. Um, but again, opportunity for outdoor living is great in this section of Miami because it's, it's a jungle. Uh, on, the left was a, on the left was a Kenneth Treester, that was his house. I believe he was a UF, uh, UF grad. But everybody has his little porches. Um, and just kind of ways to get outside the rooftop decks. Uh, this is a inside of Alfred Brown and Parker House. Um, there's a historical precedent to Coconut Grove Homes. This was the Barnacle oldest house in Miami. And it'll be right next door to um, Green Modern House. This was uh, an Arango house, a uh, famous Miami modernist. Here's Alfred Brown and Parker's uh, Vinson residence that was ranked by Wallpaper Magazine as the best residence in the world at one point in time. So I spent two or three years absorbing all of this uh, architecture and landscape that Coconut Grove had to offer. I started on my own house. So this is a picture of the house I designed for myself and my family in Coconut and I just wanted to play up the fact that you know, we're deep in the tropics here. The entire upper floor is a uh, outside terrace, and it's built on the solid base of lithic limestone. And that limestone is the rock that is uh, found all throughout Coconut Grove. But my, you know, after all the GP stuff, and after all the uh, work in New York with shop. I don't know, I guess I got romantic in a certain way with the landscape. This was a big inspiration. This was a house designed by Jeffrey Bawa, who was a Sri Lankan architect. Um, he's deceased now, but uh, there's something just very simple about this partie that, that I like. It's very simple living. So I combined that with the, you know, the ideas of the structure of those earlier Voitra houses, those Jean Weedy houses, and I wanted to try to find something in the middle. And that's how I kind of came up with this scheme. Uh, the roof structure is all exposed steel, and it's weather. Um, there it is in the setting. It, the landscape is so lush there. There's all sorts of tropical bamboo and quinceañas and palms that you know you can have neighbors you know, ten feet away from you and you don't see them. That's just the way that uh, this part of Miami developed. And 
that steel is it's actually rust paint. It's not even a real paint. Um, it's, it's not like real worked in steel. It's something called iron paint that has iron particles suspended in the paint and painted on, and only the paint is rusting. So it's a pretty good effect. But this lytic limestone, it's uh, it's unique to South Florida. In fact, here's a map that shows the distribution of it. And so here's here's the U.S. Here's Miami, and here's this uh, shape of limestone. Back to that. And if you remember that earlier uh, Google Maps satellite slide, you can see the reason why Miami and South Florida developed in that shape. That's, that's where the rock is, that's where the hard ground is. So that's why Miami is limited to that, uh, to that range. So most of the Grove is about 20 feet above sea level, which is actually pretty high. Um, there's a few places where there's some canals cut, and you can actually see, you know, there's uh, two inches of topsoil and then rock. But getting to that rock requires a little bit of imagination because there's no quarries for this material. Um, so you got to have some friends in, uh, in the know. So this was a neighbor of mine named Barry Masson, and uh, he was a kid in a sandbox. He made his own toys and his own contraptions to cut up. Uh, and harvest this with limestone. Um, he eventually bought five, five acres uh, in the suburbs of Miami and started pouring his own, his own material. They used to harvest, they used to pour this material in the Florida Keys. You know, down in the Keys, the material changes a little bit and it's called Florida Keystone. But after a while, they figured out it's not a good idea to uh, start mining all of the rock in Florida Keys because uh, there wouldn't be any Florida Keys left if they, uh, they kept that. So they've abandoned that. But what I love about this material is, you know, you can slice it up and just see these beautiful fossil records. Uh, there's star coral, brain coral, all sorts of old shells and stuff that is just embedded in this calcified, it's like a coral reef, if you will. Uh, this, is, this is the keystone. Um, so, back to the design of my own house, I wanted to use the materials uh, just to make a really, to let the house really be part of that environment. And we even use some of the material on the inside as well. And, uh, So then one day I get a knock on my door, and uh, it was a location scout for the Miami Vice movie that they filmed about five years ago. And uh, they asked if we could use our house. And I'm like, well, what for? And they said, it's a good drug or house. <laughs> so Michael Mann was the producer and director, and he came through the house with about 40 people in his entourage, and uh, they said that's that's gonna work. So that's my wife and my family we got displaced for about two weeks while they set up shop inside our house. Um, one, one, one funny thing though is that I wasn't quite done with the house because I ran out of money towards the end and I didn't have enough rock to finish all around the house. And uh, my name came up and asked me if I could if it'd be okay if they they painted some faux rock onto the unfinished parts of the house. And I told them, well, it's not that expensive. I'm just going to put the real thing up. He's like, you wouldn't mind? I'm like, no, 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 just go ahead and do it. <laughs> so they did it. And ironically, I don't think any of those parts were even shown in the movie, but they helped finish the house. So the big problem was when they finished the upstairs bedroom, Set. My wife said, let's, let's keep it. <laughs> um, so this is all fake stuff. That's actually fake rock in that place. And they, they made a movie set and last in the upstairs. Um, that's the view from the outside. For Michael Mann, our big banyan tree wasn't big enough, so they strapped down additional roots and made it even bigger. And uh, they, this was that glassed in bedroom that they made the set for. And about halfway into the two weeks, um, 
They put us up in a nice condo on Key Biscayne, but then a hurricane came, and we got evacuated from our nice condo on Key Biscayne. So we went back to the house and kind of lived like we were the uh, uh, drug lords for a while. That was really fun. Those are not family photos, those are screenshots from the movie. <laughs> but at one point, I got a, got a call from, from Universal Studios, which always accept a call from Universal Studios if they call. And they said, do you mind sending us the autopad drawings of the house? And I'm like, no. Um, so they put it next to the Iwazu Falls in South America. So that's pretty much the actual house without the helicopter and whatnot. But uh, you know, we've had many uh, sightseekers, sightseers in Miami come to our house asking to see the waterfalls. And I had to disappoint them. Our house has actually been used for 20 or 30 different TVs and commercials and things like that. This was uh, uh, a direct TV commercial campaign about uh, two years ago. But uh, um, I found that doing those location shoots, if you can design an interesting, interesting house, sometimes uh, you know, they'll bring a crew of models in, take some very nice pictures, leave you a check for two or three thousand dollars for a good day's work and it's a good way to subsidize the house. So keep that in mind. Okay, so I'm gonna fast forward ways to a current project that's still in design right now. And uh, I'm gonna take the reader to show more of a peek into our creative process and uh, the way things go from a diagram to an actual house. So this was an early concept sketch for, you know, this is a normal house for a family, uh, husband, wife, two kids. This is in Coconut Grove. Um, you know, so I, I developed a scheme like this. It's pretty much, I was thinking there was three main pods, a living room, dining room, and kitchen family. And I was going to suspend it in this grotto. And uh, we sketch up a lot uh, in the office. That's kind of our go-to default 3D model program. Um, you know, and again, so we kind of kept alive the scheme, living, dining, kitchen, family. And that's that section for that, that same thing. So we go from sketch into 3D. I like just to keep a lot of scale figures in there, cars, just so I can keep the scale in my head in projects like this. And again, this is more of a long elevation, but the living, the dining, the kitchen family, and some sort of ravine. Um, and then we just we take the model a little bit further. We, we don't, uh, all you can have two or three separate SketchUp models going with different design team people at the same time. They kind of compete against each other with the same ideas to see what, to see what emerges. So we got something like this. Um, the living, the dining, and the uh, we'll private family kitchen back. So the model evolves like this, but then I you know, take the time to realize you know, it's still too too brutal, too heavy. Um, although we did, we did show this to the client to make sure we were kind of in the right direction. And then we go back and sketch some more. So we kind of have constant back and forth process. Uh, in this case, we look at starting to actually merge those two pods and left together to see what we create, keeping that one standalone. And it gets a little bit sleeper. Every iteration kind of starts to develop a little bit more and more. So we're going to do some final tweaks and then we're ready to, to make it a little bit more real. Um, this isn't sketch. This was made in China. It actually was. We outsourced most of our final renderings um, to China. But again, you can see, I guess it's kind of dark here, but the original scheme, the original sketch, pretty much held true all the way through the process. 
the actual front of the house is on the side here. You can see it when you come there. You turn to the living room, stairs, go upstairs to the private area. And uh, we did slide that dining room over and merge it with the family room, which actually was a nice, uh, nice way of creating an outdoor patio front and center. Um, and then we created this. It wasn't going to be a natural grotto. It became much more of a you know, designed playing area. But what's interesting, after that was done, I looked back and I said, that looks kind of familiar. So as progressive as we can be sometimes, you know, it's still a very much rooted in the past. So that's that Paul Rudolph Walker residence. I had the opportunity to design a, uh, a building for an organization called the Camp Long. And the Camp Long is a botanical garden. Uh, it's in Coconut Grove, and it literally is directly across the street from my house. Um, it's on five acres. It goes from the main road all the way to the bay, and uh, this is that this is the house. And the house was built for a gentleman named Dr. David Fairchild, um, and he married Marion. Um, um, Anyhow, she was the uh, the daughter of Alexander Graham Bell. So there was a kind of a high stakes couple at the time. He was a grand explorer and he, I think he was in charge of introducing a lot of tropical fruit species into the United States. And this was his own family, family compound. Here's the main road. Here's my house right here. And this one all the way down to the bay. This is bay is like right there. So the challenge was to design a flexible pavilion that really didn't just uh, detract from the existing house that was there. It complemented it. It was low slung. So we found a way. This is our pavilion that we created there. And it kind of disappears, which was the point. Uh, the existing house is in red. Here's the main axis. This is the wedding tree, as they call it. Um, and we took this L-shaped uh, pavilion there. And the, the program was just very simple. They needed space where it would get rain on. They could have lectures. They could have receptions. Um, that kind of stuff. And they wanted to be very environmentally friendly. So we designed the entire new addition as a uh, rainwater catchment system. Uh, so we have these two 10,000 gallon cistern tanks that we bury underneath. Um, part of this is, you know, the, the garden now, they have a lot of tropical species that even for Miami in the dry winters, they need uh, more irrigation. Plants don't like the city water that much. They don't need all the chlorine and the fluoride and all that stuff that Miami puts into the water system. So the more natural rainwater we can collect, uh, the better. But it was a little arrow bringing in these tanks. Um, they were like the external tanks of the space shuttle. And we had to lift them with the crane over this existing house that's on the National Historic Register. So everybody was nervous on, on this day. The one thing I want to point out is, you know, we built, here's the hole to receive these tanks. And again, you can see this rock, which is uh, it's that lunatic limestone that I talked about. And look at the top soil, it's about four inches or so. So all of that green, all of that mushrooms that you see, it's growing in just four inches of topsoil. All the rest of the nutrients come, comes from the rock itself. So then there's also the debate, this was going to be a uh, glass-in structure at first. But being the mission of the garden, they really wanted to embrace the sustainability feature. So we the idea, well, why don't we just have an open view, not even screen, not even glass. Um, at first we were concerned about it being too hot, but uh, yeah. okay. what we found, we left these uh, openings unglazed, the hole in the middle and just the cross ventilation worked really well so um, it became an open air pavilion instead. Uh, here's a construction photo putting on like a bit of limestone rock so it's really a soft rock. Remember you can't go out and buy this, you can't go to a quarry. Find it or call a friend of Bear Mass and go dig some in his backyard. 
but uh, it's a really it's a really beautiful material to work with, and because it comes from the ground, we're actually able to get some of it from the hole that we dug in the uh, um, the tanks where the rainwater system is out of. But this is it in its raw form, and they cut the material on site before they put it up. And this is the Florida Keystone that uh, also gets cut on site. And, you know, using these local materials is just, of course, it has its advantages from sustainability and the embodied energy principle, but you know, it grounds it to its local site. It is local architecture. So you can start to use it before the building is finished. Okay, and here's a very small addition that we did for a house that is directly across the street from the garden. So, starting my own small practice, the word of mouth kind of kept going around the neighborhood, so kept getting these smaller uh, odd jobs. But here's the house right here, existing house, um, and we proposed this uh, structure for. It was a single woman with five large dogs. Every dog was at least this big. And uh, she wanted to have a big pool in the front yard, but Zillian could not allow for pools in the front yard unless they were two feet deep or less. So I said, let's have a dog pool in the front yard, which is this one. And that's her pool. The only program was a living room and a front porch. But in my mind, the program was to drastically changed the entire house. And this was the existing house. You know, it was a rock house. This was uh, that limestone. It was actually a wood frame house, and they put this limestone on the outside. And uh, she loved her vines. She's like, don't touch the vines. This is kind of a creepy house. And I was thinking, how do I add on to that to only let me touch the, this stuff? So, Construction photos. That's Ruth saying, When's it going to be done? <laughs> and that's the finishing. So we pretty much completely hid camouflage with the existing house and made a new front porch and entry for her. So here's using the limes. This is actually the Port of Keystone, stained concrete. And it was an immediate hit. It totally transformed her house. The ugly thing, the low lines that still did in the back, but uh, we managed to create something that was altogether different. Okay, the next house I'm going to show you is Winter Haven, Florida. And this is a house that I got to design for my parents, who uh, no longer needed to be living in a Six bedroom GD house because they're way empty nesters. So it's always fun to have a house for your parents because you already know exactly how they want to live and you know the nuances of their lifestyle. Um, obviously, they are still, still a fan of modernism. Um, they wanted the walls of glass, they wanted a really clean, modern house. So the diagram for this house was beginning extremely simple, divided into two, uh, two areas, private, public, and allow each of them to have, you know, expansive views of the lake. Uh, this is actually on one lake over from where uh, the house that I, I grew up in. So the diagrams start to translate into, into the floor plans, construction photos, This is the front there, actually. It's okay to turn back on the street sometimes. And it's just, it's so this was also uh, time to start to introduce some of the sustainable principles. Any questions in the back? Where is this in Winter Haven? It's in Winter Haven on Middle Way Notice. Okay. From Winter Haven? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so this is a 8.6 uh, uh, kilowatt solar panel installation. 
It's uh, I'm creating these trays on the roof of the parapet, so you don't see all the candles when you go to the house on the street and all that. Um, we can come into some challenging loading scenarios because uh, you know, these solar panels, they're not physically attached. They're not, there's no penetration to the roof structure below. They're all ballasted, so the winds won't blow them away. But you can imagine, in this case, the roof trusses, the wood roof trusses are running this way. Trusses are running in the same direction that the ballast of both this was down, so that was a uh, last minute thing we had to overcome. But, uh, um, yeah. Okay, so here's an interior shot. One thing I want to bring your attention is this isn't wood, it's a new product called Resista. And Resista, it's a fake wood, but it's the most convincing fake wood that I've ever seen. And the reason that it's so convincing is, is that it uses uh, rice husks, mineral oil, and salt. So I think the rice husk element it makes it like, feel like an actual material, unlike the plastic stuff you've seen before. So when this house was done, it was the um, it was the largest residential use of the material um, at its time. So we used it both inside and out, and it became the uh, Cover job for this one. So this company I think is really taking off because what started as it was a Malaysian company that was just designing docks for marinas, and they found out that there's a really good use for this. Um, and you know, on this kind of house, we would have normally used a uh, FSC um, IPE or T type wood, but you get an FSC, well, FSC certified top of hardwood, it's going to be double the cost of, of, that, of a non FSC certified wood. And using non FSC certified wood, you can't have a lead certified house. So, this was smart. They, uh, they priced their product you know, kind of in between the cost of FSC certified wood and non FSC certified wood. So, I think they have a, they've got a good thing going there. These are a few just other projects, just random projects, going through real quick. This happens to be also a little bit of notice directly next door to the house of my parents right there. So again, word of mouth can get you keep the uh, projects coming in. Including this picture because this is unlike work that I usually do. This is for Fair Travel Tropical Garden in Miami. I think because of the work I did for the other garden, I got this job and they wanted something really modern. They had a uh, president of the garden that was um, from Great Britain and they loved the new Richard Rogers pavilion they did somewhere out there in the English countryside. That's what they wanted. So, about six months into the project, he got fired. They got somebody else and said, Can we do Caribbean plantation style? Yes, but you know, it brings up some interesting dilemmas that we can have with an architecture firm. What happens if somebody pulls the rug out from underneath you halfway through the design? What are you obligated to do? Um, of course, there's nothing in my contract that said it must be a modern building or this or that, but uh, so I saw the project through to uh, halfway through the construction document phase, and we did a uh, pass over to our corporate record that saw us all with it through. But uh, this is actually opening next week in Miami. This and like three other buildings as a uh, state of the art, five million dollar butterfly and orchid exhibit. But uh, um, these were surrenders that we did. But I wanted to use that to segue into a general talk about the environment. So, you know, a lot of people think South Florida is this, but the dangers that we have 
in Miami. Um, and if I use Miami as an example, we have a lot of, a lot of people closer together and the, the uh, uh, environmental dangers seem actually much more closer at hand. Um, here is a projected sea level rise diagram. And again, this is in 2007. But just projecting a 20 foot rise on the state of Florida really shakes things up a little bit. Um, especially in South Florida, which isn't there. Uh, Gainesville is seeing like you're doing all right. Uh, St. John's River gets a little crazy. But uh, um, this was 20 feet. And you know, I, I think the realistic projections now are more around inches or two feet or so over in the next entry. But uh, they seem to be upping this thing every every year. This is the other reason that we've got to change our ways. And there's another one. So to bring it back to South Florida, most people think this is this is the Everglades, we're fine. The problem is, these are pictures actually of Lake Okeechobee and some droughts that we had in about, again, about, about four years ago. Okay, so the last picture was to the west of downtown Miami. To the south of the Florida Keys, we're having all this coral bleaching. The coral reefs are dying off. To the east, we have problems too. I know what this is. This is the sewage outflow pipe from Miami Dade County uh, going into the Gulf Stream. It's only about a mile offshore. Um, for some reason, Miami Dade County, Broward County, Palm Beach County are so the only three counties in the state that have gotten some sort of environmental passes where they're still allowed, I think, for the next 30 years to be pumping the sewage into the Gulf Stream. So, you wonder why they keep closing beaches sometimes because of the bacteria counts. Um, the fish seem to love this, but uh, um, it's kind of scary what we're actually still still doing. I'm glad we live at the bottom upstream, I guess. And out, out in the west, there's you know, the uh, concern of future development going into the Everglades, um, especially in Miami. So everything is so congested, big pushes by developers to move what's called the urban boundary line further west into the Everglades. So how do we change the future? You know, I'm going to get to you guys, not just through design and architecture, but through technologies and engineering to, um, to make the house work better. You guys get a chance to re-envision how neighborhoods are going to look like. Now, transportation is going to be. This, I think this is the Model S sedan that's coming out this year. This is another South Florida problem. You know, Tandy and Trail, Highway 41 in South Florida, it cuts across the Everglades currently and becomes just a dam. There's a few pipes every now and then that lets water through. Um, but currently underway is a smaller version of the scheme which is called the Everglades Skyway, which actually raises the entire road to let the Everglades flow underneath it. So I'm going to go back to applying those concerns of the environment into my own life. So uh, I needed to add a garage to my house. So this was a way to do it. Again, talking about local architecture and uh, low impact architecture. This was an Indian chicken. And believe it or not, there is a, uh, there is not a loophole, but there is a clause in the uh, Florida Building Code that says you don't need a permit to, if you have big Sufi Indians, come in and design and build a chicken for you. Um, so just knowing how cumbersome the, the permitting requirements are in Miami, I thought this would be a very easy way to go. And um, this was actually one. One Mikasuki Indian uh, is the foreman. I think he had about, about 10 Mexicans working as a laborer, so they need to update the, the code for that, I think. But uh, it's still about through without the permit. Uh, 
for our second car, we got a Gym, gym car, and our neighbors even got the uh, stretch gym car. But at, you know, at night, we just plug these things in and they recharge. And for Coconut Grove, it seemed to work perfectly. Uh, so we put solar panels on our roof too, and we use the what's called peel and stick solar. It literally comes in these rolls and they glue it down. Um, this application doesn't work for everything, but we have a flat roof. Long flat roof, which we did, um, it's a perfect application. So, the fact that this technology, I mean, it still costs $45,000, but it looks like in two years you could buy a target for $2,000 or $20. But the good thing is, at the time, the state of Florida had a rebate program. So, to get a check back from them for $19,000 for putting these things on the roof, um, it made the whole, the whole thing more palatable. Uh, the state of Florida has since discontinued this program to get out of hand, but I think they got tired of cutting checks that day. So, at the beginning, Stephen mentioned that my firm is based in Miami, but we're also in Telluride, right Colorado. About two years ago, I moved my family out to Telegram, Colorado, and uh, I zoomed back on the map. This is the exact same distance back as that first picture I showed you of South Florida. Uh, what's fascinating is without the boundaries and labels and shorelines, you have no idea what scale you're looking at here. Um, this map actually goes from Salt Lake City to Denver, which is somewhere up in here. Albuquerque is down there at the bottom. So I guess it's an argument that I, just, I love maps, but I'm just intrigued by the fact that you can still look at this and zoom in and have no idea what you're looking at until you get to a certain scale. Um, this one I just know from, I know this intimately, that Grand Junction, I believe is right here, and I won't recognize probably any other city names on here. But I happen to live in this little box canyon right here, a little town called Telluride. Um, but even as we get closer in its scale, we don't see any human impact on the environment. Um, at this scale on the Florida map, you can totally see, you know, where the metropolitan areas were, the metropolitan areas were, where they weren't. Okay, zooming in further, you can start to see uh, the ski resort part of town is right there. Tiny towns right there in that valley. So that's pretty much it's a town of 2,000 people. There's another 2,000 people who have ski homes. Uh, for the most part, we live up here on the mountain. Um, this is a big ridge going down. But Telluride is a Say a one street town, it's a one main street town for sure. There's, uh, there's no stoplight, there's no McDonald's, there's no Wendy's, there's no combination pizza hut, Taco Bell, there's uh, no Starbucks. There are five medical marijuana dispensaries there. I think I changed the name to just five marijuana dispensaries next month because it's now going to be recreational dispensaries. It's going to be legal. So, when I moved to Tokyo, I had two projects in the, my office in Miami, and I had two employees, and I had a lot, of, a lot more free time. And so, I spent some time just kind of playing around in the snow and the mountains, and I did this, uh, this art exhibit, if you will. It's just, sculpture exhibit, there's really no other reason for doing it except for doing it, and I had three time on my hands. Um, but this was the first of a series of these arrays that are just simple with those that uh, I still want to, to replicate this in different areas across the country, one in the desert, one other places. But uh, my thought was I had my mind to really explore this more artistic side of architecture. 
then I got a got busy with other things in Miami and finally was turned around. So I'll get back with you on that. But I wanted to share this the the mindset that I had. Um, it's kind of nice being able to run an office out of Tell you right and have it all the major stuff happen in Miami because uh, I get to go back once a month for several days and check in and um, you know see how everything's going. But you know, in Tell you right, I'm working remotely and I can be so much more creative um, out there uh, in the mountains. So I have a piece of property that we just closed on last week. Um, it's about three quarters of an acre, but it backs up to five acres. And the immediate thing I figured out was, like, oh shit, it's contour lines. Working in Florida for 10 years, you don't have any contour lines except maybe two. So I remember when I was taking the ARES, that was the part that scared me the most, was the contour section. And somehow I'm it. But uh, out of Telluride, I mean, these, these types of lines, the first thing you do is design a driveway. Wait a second, I mean to design the house first. I know you gotta design the driveway first, and where the house is gonna go. And uh, so you went straight into engineering the driveway is the first part of designing the house here. Um, do some early concept sketches. I, you know, in my mind, you know, I start with these rough models, and I, I do start with rough, rough digital models, but it's just the direction I wanted to take things. And then you hit the roadblock what the local design review board wants to see. This is a Thomas Kincaid painting, arguably the worst commercial painter our country has ever produced. But no, this is, this is typical what you see. This is the kind of architecture that is encouraged out there. I look at the design regulations, and they tell me no flat roofs, no large expanses of glass, no exposed concrete, no white stuff out. What can I do? So again, I start with these rough rough models, they get a little more refined, a little more refined. And this is this is what I'm working on now. I'm probably gonna start construction on this in the springtime. But uh, it's ironic to go back to my house in Miami, which was primary materials were stone, rusted metal, and glass. So somehow I ended up with the exact same palette in Miami and in Colorado, and they still, they still both seem appropriate and contextual. Okay, here's another few sample projects that we're working on. This is, this is the, the Perry Bear residence uh, downtown Miami. It's under construction right now. Uh, I was just down there last week and they've already probably poured the top slab for that right now. We've got a commanding view of downtown Miami on this same day. Uh, this was another project. Uh, they wanted modern Hollywood glamour, so this is what I came up with. That. But it's also under construction. Um, Big open up road. Here's a house in the Florida Keys, um, Tavernier, and what the building department with that. You know, I think beautiful architecture creates beautiful construction drawings too. We still do basket models from time to time, although the computer model seems much more prevalent. Uh, this is another house that we have under construction in Coconut Grove. Here's a house we have in the Bahamas that's under construction. Uh, this was a scheme for a house we have in Miami. And there's another house we have in Miami Beach that is on the permit right now. So uh, these last these last several images, I think I would underscore the fact that the economy, at least in Miami, has really turned around. The real estate market has turned. We're actually booming again. We're busier now than we were at the height of 2007, 2008. So you know, it's good news for all you guys because I know it's been a um, slow, uh, slow time for the profession in general. But hopefully Miami will be a, uh, a right point in the economy turning around in Florida. So I'll conclude with that.
Yeah. Any questions that can be answered?